from Gardening at Duenza here in Ireland and today I have a very exciting plant to tell you about, one that I have recently purchased seeds for. Again, from my favourite seed company, which is the South African Silver Hill Seeds. Now, this plant we are going to look at today is a, an Erythrina. Many of you may know the group Erythrina as producing trees, trees with beautiful pendulant, mostly red and orange flowers and something that certainly I would struggle to grow with, even in a greenhouse in my climate. Now, while this plant I am going to grow today is an Erythrina, it is a different animal altogether. It's not a tree and this plant, where it grows, is beneath the ground. It's a codex plant, but it's one that produces a great big tuber underneath the soil. So much so that the majority of the plant is not visible to the eye. So it grows above, and above you might have recurved spines and very unusual hairy leaves and eventually flowers that look to my eyes very much like an aloha. But beneath the ground is where it's all happening and where this plant over time will produce a tuber that's like about three foot wide. Its common name is plough breaker because in South Africa where this plant grows, these tubers, as you might imagine, are doing a very good job of breaking the plough. So it's all a bit of an experiment as to whether this plant with its enormous underground tuber can actually be grown longer term in a pot, but I'm going to give it a try. How could I not grow something as exciting and interesting and unusual as this? So today we are going to sow some plough breaker seeds. And before we kick off with sowing these amazing seeds, I want to just make a little note about Silver Hill seeds. Now Silver Hill seeds are in South Africa, but they will post worldwide. Postage is a little bit expensive, but what you are guaranteed is very good, very, very fresh seeds. And this is particularly important, for example, in the Amaryllis family where the seeds need to be sown fresh or not at all and Silver Hill will put you on their list for amaryllis seeds and when they are ripe they will send you an email and you can choose to purchase or not. However, this isn't an amaryllis seed we're going to sow today but I just thought in terms of where you might source these beauties, particularly South African beauties, Silver Hill seeds is certainly a good port of call. And now for the moment of truth when we open up this packet and see what these seeds look like. And I am led to believe that they are unusual. Oh goodness, would you look at that? So they're red and very berry-like in their appearance, but they're hard so there's nothing berryish about them at all and I have five beautiful seeds as big as a tree peony seed and waiting to be sown. Now these are seeds that are going to need scarification. Certain seeds in the wild have developed a coating and the reason for developing that coating is to ensure that the seed doesn't break open, doesn't germinate until conditions are favorable for it to do so. So these seeds have a hard coating that will need to be broken down by one of a number of things depending on the environment. It could be that the vigors of a cold winter and frost will break down the, that heavy coating. It could be that the seed expects to be eaten by some animal and pass through its digestive tract where the tummy acids will do the work in breaking down the coating. Or it could be that the plant expects mice to nibble on its seeds. And they say that this is the reason why these 
Zephyrina seeds have developed their thick coating. Now, I don't have any mice handy, thankfully, so we're going to have to do nature's work for it. We're going to have to mechanically break through the thick coating of this seed so that it will germinate quickly and give me those fantastic plants. And this process is called scarification, and there are various ways to do it. So you can scarify your seed coating by rubbing it with sandpaper, for example, by clipping it just a little bit with the nail clippers or by using boiling water. And today we're going to use boiling water. So without further ado, we're going to switch on the kettle and get that water nice and hot. And then we're going to let it cool slightly to 180 degrees. I'm going to pour this water into my cup. And now with my trusty thermometer, I am just going to see what temperature it is. Now this is a beer thermometer, which my husband has kindly lent me. And we are just gonna stick it in here in the boiling water. So we're looking for 82 degrees Celsius or 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are very nearly there. You see how it's dropping down? So at the point when this water is 180 degrees, which I think is round about now, we are going to whip out the thermometer and pop in the seeds. And you can see that three of the seeds have sunk and two are floating. And I think sinking is what we're looking for. So once out, this cup is hot. Surprise, surprise. Once the seeds sink, it may be that they've absorbed a lot of water. The three at the bottom can't have done so already. In any case, what we're going to do is just leave these seeds in the water, waiting for them to cool down. I think we will leave them for a minimum of three hours, overnight possibly, but not longer than that. And then we're going to sow them. And here we are, ready to make up a mix to sow our seeds in. I have a sandy mix here, something like cactus compost, so ordinary compost or potting mix, as you call it in the States mixed with horticultural sand and I'm going to mix that with added perlite just to make sure that this plant has extra drainage. Just give that a bit of a mix around. Now I'm taking the little container that I washed earlier I'm going to put the mix in here. Filling five cells. Now just pressing quite gently down here at the top to make sure there are no air pockets and cleaning up. And what I'll do now is just pop my tray into a bowl of water just to hydrate it and get the mixture totally drenched. And I will remove this and it's time to sow our seeds. And the moment of truth. Here are the seeds that we soaked yesterday. And as you can see, four of them have sunk to the bottom. And that happened pretty immediately after I put them in the water. And one is a floater. And my guess would be that the floater is the one that isn't viable and the others are. But this is just a guess because I don't really know these seeds. So now what I'm going to do is take them out and sow them on the surface here. And I've started off with the floaty one. I'm going to put it in this cell here so I can remember which one it is. And just taking a look at the seeds. I am going to try and work out which way is up because these are big seeds so we need to sow them the right way up. Now I would be fairly confident that that is the upside and that is the downside but you know what in case of doubt what we'll do is just sow the seeds on their side 
Now at the moment I'm just placing these on the surface of the soil. Ooh, that is a big boy. This one is a much lighter colour than the other one, isn't that odd? I'm going to put that one here. Big boy. A small one, redder in colour again. Another small one, they're all kind of different shapes, which is really interesting. Nothing uniform about them. And I wonder if these bulbous seeds are an indication of the enormous caudex that's going to be below the soil once this plant comes up. And I think it is. I read somewhere that one of the reasons why this plant produces an enormous caudex is that it should have a better chance of survival after fires, which happen so frequently in South Africa. Okay, so now we're going to cover the seeds and the general rule of thumb is to plant something three times its depth, whether it's a seed or whether it's a bulb. The rule of thumb for sowing seeds does not apply in the case of these Zephrina seeds and they actually need to be sown quite near the surface of the mix so that they're almost like almost on the surface. And a good source for South African seed information or plant information is Sanbi or the South African Biodiversity website, which has lots of really good information on it. Okay, now the great thing about vermiculite is that it doesn't really count as covering the seeds. It lets light come through. Look at this. So the information was that it shouldn't, they shouldn't be covered by anything more than one millimeter. I'm going to put it into this plastic bag. Um, the name is here and it's kind of obscuring the light, so I'll just turn the bag around like this so it's completely transparent over the top. And now I will just knot it or tie it here. Now by putting this into a plastic bag, I've created a closed system, one from which moisture cannot escape. So any moisture that's in there is just going to circulate and go round and around. So that means that I shouldn't have to water this again until such a point in time as the shoots start coming up and then we need to take the lid off. And here we are upstairs in my secret seed sprouting and precious plant overwintering spot and down there is the reptile mat that I use to germinate seeds on. Container here just to kind of buffer it a little bit and just place my seeds in there on the heat where hopefully they will start germinating. And here we are just a mere five days later and I have some very very exciting news relating to my plough breaker which is what's going on in here underneath the plastic bag and I don't know can you actually see can you see a spot of green in there we're gonna have a look and <clears throat> that involves taking off this elastic band that we so carefully tied around the front. So exciting. There's nothing like germinating your own seeds for level of excitement. When those seeds eventually flower, that's the sense of accomplishment, but the excitement is when you see them popping up their little heads above the surface. And now, mm, you see it? I'm going to remove this bag and look, look at that. Can you see the red seed has like split its coating open and up came this little shoot. Just taking a little closer look at the other cells here 
and can you see how this one here the seed has moved to the surface and there's something similar happening over here because the mix in the middle has just risen ever so slightly so I suspect that these two are thinking about germinating as well and the whole thing here now is what to do should we take off the lid to ensure that this surefire seedling that is up gets enough air and light to keep going or do we keep the lid on <laughs> to make sure that this pair here have enough humidity and moisture to germinate so we're just gonna take this and put it down here and with my orchid pot I'm gonna place this on top like this and I'm just gonna put a bit of this stuff around just to keep the moisture in but not to such an extent that it is completely locked so perhaps a halfway house and hopefully I'll only have to do this for a day or two until I can see the other seedlings poke their way up and then I can take the lid off completely because the seed that has germinated really does need air now at this stage. So up we go again and I guess we'll just put that over here on the heat and here we are a day later and we are going to open this up and see now putting this in here for a day nothing else has germinated despite my best ministrations and oh 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 okay so here is the seedling and what a funny fellow it is too and i think what's happening Actually, no. If we turn around here, look, I don't know. Can you see that? But it looks like the seed has split open and the seedling has come out from the inside, which is perfectly normal. But what is really strange about this is how it isn't one shoot going up with two false leaves on it, which is the way that seedlings normally emerge. So that's very strange. But Look, 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 there's definitely, definitely, definitely something happening here. This is moving up and I think this one is about to blow, but I am not going to leave it covered anymore. I am going to take the cover off now. And there is something happening here. There's definitely something happening with this one. Hmm. And look here how the seed has moved up in the soil and there is something coming. There's definitely something coming there. I'm not going to touch it. Don't ever touch stuff when it's this vulnerable. What I'm going to do is I am going to cut this cell out of the tray. And in that way then I can keep this one in a different environment to the ones that haven't germinated yet or that are about to germinate. Now, if this were annuals or very common seeds, I wouldn't wreck my little tray, but these are very precious ones. So now I can keep this separately from the other ones. And here I am with the emerging seedlings and the ungerminated seedlings all wrapped up nicely. And I'm just going to put my one germinated seed here I'm doing a halfway house thing so I need to get him used to light and air so this is a north facing window it's not going to be too bright and I've taken off the cover so he's getting less humidity but I'm going to keep it on the heat mat maybe for a little while and just see how that goes. And hello there, very exciting day. Time to repot my plough breakers. 
So come on in here and let's have a look at what I've got. And here is what we have. So let's just have a look at this. Now, this is the original tray that I sewed everything in and you can see that that seed that floated never germinated. So I was right to suspect it was a dud one. But all of the other four did. Now this one here was the one that you saw germinate in the last video and I potted it on some 20 days ago when it was the same size as these ones here and look how brilliantly it's doing. And let us just kind of excavate a bit of the soil here just to see if we can find this amazing codex that is going to go on to fabulous things. And look at that fleshiness that I can see extending down into the earth. So this is a really good indication of what's to come. We can still see the seed, strangely enough. It hasn't withered away. Still see it split open, but there's a lot of root and cordex stuff coming down below. And let's have a look and see how it's doing in its pot. And I think if we have a look there, you can see that the roots are coming out the base, which is a sign probably that it's time to put this into a larger pot. But we're not going to do that today. We're going to concentrate on the smaller boys and pot them up. And let's just pause and have a look at the runt of the litter, this little one first, because there's something really interesting going on here. Can you see how the original seed has moved up here and that's just sitting there with a lot of the medium on top of it. But down below here, this is the codex, this is the codex forming and it's actually above the ground and looks very meaty and substantial. And my plan longer term with these plants are to elevate the codex. Now that I have a couple of them, I can experiment. It's not something I've heard can be done with this particular plant, but we're going to give it a go. However, if we look closely at this one, you can tell that it doesn't look very healthy. And in fact, the leaves are very anemic looking. And this one, from the moment it germinated, it was like it was albino. The leaves ha seemed to have no chlorophyll in, to, in them whatsoever. Now, I tried giving it a little bit of magnesium and a little bit of iron. The deficiency of magnesium or iron in plants can lead to paleness like this, but it seems to have done no good. And I thought, well, okay, let's see what happens. But just recently, as we can see here, this leaf is wilting and a leaf fell off today. So it looks like it's doing okay, but it's not, I think it's on the way out. Now it's not too much light because the others have the same light and when I saw that this was happening, I did move it into less light and it seems to have made no difference. So unfortunately, I think I'll just discard this one and concentrate on these two other ones, repotting them because they're the ones that have done really, really well. And this one here is the same size as the big guy was when I potted it up. So we are going to pot him up today. And I guess the first thing we'll do is try and get him out of this container. Okay, so let's get this guy out and just very gently because we don't want to damage the emerging roots. Now normally I would wait until I saw roots coming out from the base of the plant before potting on, but with this guy I feel that there's a whole lot going to go on underneath the ground and we need to make sure it's not held back in any way. Ooh! <laughs> Look at that! My goodness! The medium has just fallen away and actually I can't see many roots but look at the size of the codex on that. It's really extending down like a giant carrot. We have a couple of little roots but it was actually bent at the base from, do you see how it's bent, bent under when it hit the, the bottom and went sideways. So we'll have none of that. Let's put it into a bigger pot. And here we have my mix. And 
for this mix I'm using I guess about two parts organic to one part inorganic so I've got horticultural sand in here and I am going to just lower my codex in here and you can tell how far how deep it's going to go because that's how long it is at the moment so it won't have a whole lot of time before it'll need a bigger pot but we will cross that bridge when we come to it now I'm actually going to plant the seed or bury the seed and I mentioned earlier on how I intend longer term to experiment with this plant and to raise the codex above soil level but this isn't the moment to do it and with seedling codex plants in general it's not a good idea to raise them above soil level because they develop much more slowly if you do that. Now I said I was going to bury the seed but I am aware of the fact that that is where the stem starts and I don't want to bury the stem. So we are going to go with that and now I'm going to give it a bit of water. And here we go, my two plough breakers all potted up. I'm not going to touch the little one just yet, going to give it a little bit longer to grow, but these two are looking good. And I always feel that if you have three seedlings, then that's a very good recipe because if something goes wrong, then, you know, more than three, then you can give them to friends or sell them or whatever. And um, yeah, but three is the minimum number. Okay, I hope you liked this video about the plow breaker, this amazing plant from South Africa that has so much going on below the soil, an unusual codex, and that you will check back for more unusual videos. This plant you will see integrate itself into my collection now and feature in other videos going forward so look out for it thank you for watching and i hope you have a wonderful sunday bye